<laughs> oh, your enthusiasm is inspiring. Thank you very much. I love when people volunteer. <laughs> All right, he needs a pad or something to take notes. You need a pad? No, sir. Yeah. A lady like you should yeah, be able right. to get so easy. <laughs> All right, folks. Um, we will get started at this point. Uh, my name is Charles Myrtle. I chair the Land Use Committee of Community Board Number 8. To my right is the chair of the board, Julie Reyes. The other distinguished dignitaries are members of the committee or interlopers who regularly visit with us. Mr. Gelman. Um, we have a very crowded agenda, so what I will ask you to do is to keep your questions as pointed as possible. Um, the first item is to welcome the committee members and do a roll call. Dan, can you do the quick roll call? Have you got a uh, Where's the sign sheet? Okay. So, Chuck. Yep. Uh, Marty. Here. Uh, Bob. Here. Carol. Here. Um, Lee Chung. Absent. Um, Omar Murray. He is excused because of ill health. Um, Adina Rivera. Adiana. Oh. Adiana, you're here, so you'll sign the second. Daniel here. Jessica Sosa, I'm currently here. And Laura Spalter is not here. So guess... She's going to run a little late, she said. Okay, we're ha we have quorum at second. Good. And if she's here. First item in, on the agenda is it approval by the committee of the minutes of the last meeting held on June 4, 2024. Um, are there any questions, corrections, or comments? Hearing none, may I have a motion to adopt? Motion to adopt. Second, all those in favor, aye. Contrary minded, done. Second, third item on the agenda is a SNAD application at 5501 Palisade Avenue. Is the applicant present or someone representing the applicant? Michael Sano, or wait, 5501? Yes. Somebody here on behalf of the applicant. Going once. No, 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 don't hold on. Going once. I, I, to the left, Joseph Locus, Locusano, second row. Uh, I'm here. I am here. All right. Would you please tell us what this is all about? Yes. First off, my name is Michael Sana. Joseph is my partner. And I am the principal architect of Santa Maria Locasano Architects, representing uh, the property owner. The project consists of demolishing an existing home on a 73,000 square foot piece of property and providing two single family residences on a single zoning lot. The first home is being built over the footprint, substantially over the footprint of the first home and the second home is being built uh, alongside of it on the property as indicated on the plans that I've distributed. Hold on a moment, sir. Will you repeat that? The first home is what? Is built over the footprint of the existing home. And the second is... What does is, that mean? What does that mean? Are you demolishing the existing home? 
Yes. And building two. I'm sorry, is the answer yes? The answer is yes. We are demolishing the existing home. All right. And what is the aggregate land mass of each of the two homes? aggregate land mass it's approximately yeah. about about uh i i don't have the uh i could share my screen uh if you'd like uh put the plan yeah, up make... if you'd like me to do that i could probably point it out a little bit easier right. on the wall. Yeah. Uh, or as well as i've distributed uh several copies that came FedEx today for the uh, community board members to view. Would you like me to share the screen? Yes, please. Yes. Thank you. Can everyone see it? No. Too far. Too far. Nobody other than me. I have a copy of the plan. Where is uh, the shirt? I think the back of him. I should have to give him. He has to do it though. Yeah. Uh, uh, did you allow me to share the screen? I yes. did. Yes. Okay, I'm, I'm staring at uh, uh, the plan CPC one in front of me, and uh, can anyone else see it? Did you click on share? I did. Can you share the right window? Let Let me try again. Let me try. How's that? Well, no, nothing new. No. Okay. There we go. Yes. Now it's working. All right. Okay, great, great, great. All right. So this is the uh, site plan for the project. Uh, as you can see at the bottom of the screen, uh, there is a, a one house there, and above it, a second home. The original home was located substantially under the first house at the bottom of the screen, or to the south. Second and what is the aggregate house. land mass of each of the two properties? Okay. One property. No, no, no. There are going to be two houses there. Each will probably have its own deed, etc., to a piece of land. And I want to know what. 8,500 square feet of footprint for both homes. Okay. All right. For, is that combined or each has 8,500? No, both. Combined. That's the footprint. You're saying combined they have 8,500? Yes, that's two the, footprints. The they're, they're multiple stories. Of the land. How much land will each have? Is there a backyard? Is there a front yard? Oh. What have you got? Okay, well, I, I didn't quite understand what you were saying. Uh, each has a backyard, one, one lot, the lot area. Okay, let me, I'll bring up the second uh, document. Right. <clears throat> it's approximately about uh, 16,000 square feet for the smaller lot and about 43,000 square feet for the first lot as the first lot okay. encompasses the area that is behind the home and is steeply sloped, which is going to remain in its natural state. So the rear portion of the property 
uh, is going to remain without being touched as part of the natural area district approval. Let me put it into focus. This is immediately to the north of SAR, correct? This is correct. And there is now an existing house on the side on the property closer to SAR, correct? The, the Metro North line runs at the bottom of along the Hudson River. At the bottom of this hill, which would be directly east uh, west, would be where the train line is currently. So this is upslope of the Metro North train line. Are you to the west or to the east of Palisade Avenue? The west. It's it's a, he must be west. 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 It's an odd number. So you have between you and Metro North, you have Palisade Avenue, right? That is correct. Okay. So Palisade right. Avenue now. is the frontage of the property. Palisade Avenue is what? Palisade Avenue is to the east, which runs fronting both of these lots. Right. So oh, the current house is 5505. Five, oh, five. Now, 5501. Five, oh, which means that they are west of Palisade, on the western side of Palisade Avenue. Right, and down that slope is the parking lot for Metro North. Um, if you were to like fall yeah, down. Um, if, if I understood Mr. Locasano correctly, he said the combined footprint would be something like 8,500 square feet. Is that correct, Mr. Locasano? Yes, by the name, uh, the name is Santa. Uh, that, just my partner is, uh, the name is up on the screen. My name is Oh, Mike. okay, sorry. Yeah. All right, in, in the um, agenda that we have for tonight's meeting, it says that the total square feet would be a little over 9,500, not 8,500. Uh, and, and for the entire property, uh, you gave a figure of, I believe, 60,000 and 40,000 approximately. No, no, but, no. Uh, uh, the, the lot area okay, of the whole lot is around 73,000 square feet. And... Forty-three thousand is for what uh, the house to the south of the lot. The remainder okay, is but... being provided for the house number two, which is to the north. All right, but uh, again, on the agenda, it shows the total amount of open space at sixty-five thousand square feet. So the figures you're giving us and the figures we're looking at are very different. 65,000 square feet of open space. No, that, that's, that's, right. that's not correct. That's not correct. The, all the information is clearly indicated you know, on the plan. Should be uh, very clear to you. Uh, let me open up the other drawing. The uh, the total uh, of of pervious area on that's been remaining, which I've I've blown up the screen for you to see, is thirty nine thousand six hundred and fifty six square feet, but the total lot area combined is seventy three thousand. For the remainder of thirteen thousand eight hundred and eighty eight is the total impervious surface area, which includes the buildings, porches, driveways, sidewalks, pools, and patios. The numbers of the building footprint, which is what I referred to, as you see on uh, 5501, is 4,763 square feet, and the footprint for the second home is 2,889. <laughs> The sum of which is the 7,800 square feet around that I that I, I I mentioned, not including porches and other things which are indicated here. 
Let me see if I can put this into focus as to where I'm going. There is, as I understand it from these plans, a minimum amount of land mass between the two buildings, probably 10 feet, no more. Am I right with that? Uh, no, it has to do with the relative height between the buildings. And in this particular case, I have 30 feet. How many? 30, 30. Three, zero. Okay. So the get so between the two buildings is an aggregate of 30 feet, correct? Correct. How much of the total land does each of the buildings separately occupy? In other words, you have two separate buildings yes. on two separate, essentially two separate parcels. How much of each of the parcels does each of the buildings occupy? That includes porches, et cetera. That would be, uh, you'd be able to, that would be the sum of, I mean, I don't have that. I mean, all the figures are here. I could sum it up for you and give it to you in a minute. Uh, the building footprint, which is literally the structure itself, the from the when viewed from the sky, we have front porches, stairs, and sidewalks. So are you referring to literally the amount that the building footprint with its correct uh, front porch would occupy? All right, give me right. one second and I'll, I'll add it up. Would I be amiss if I said it was the building, including porches and the like, at least as to the building to the west? No, building to the north. It occupies approximately 70% of the lot. Not even close. of the house to the north takes 3,002.27 square feet divided by it's about 18% on the smaller house and considerably less, more like 12% on the larger lot. A lot of You're saying on the larger house, the house itself with all the appurtenances to it occupies something on the order of 40% of the lot area. Is that right? Are you asking me about driveways and patios? Patios? No, I just want to know how the building, the structural portion. I, I just gave you that. Uh, on the second lot, it's 18%. On the first lot, it's about 15%. I have a 43,000 square foot lot for the southern lot and only 4,763 square feet of the building footprint. That's about 10% right there. Pardon me? I'm having trouble with these numbers. About 10 or 11 percent of his property. You add in the... Yes. Part of the South House's property. So that's why he's, it's yep. a smaller number than it looks like. Right, all of that goes to the well, South House. extremely helpful is a context map. The last the, page has this. The neighboring houses, oh. where is it? exist here. We do not have that, nor do we have photographs. That you do. You both, incidentally, did you notify all of the um, adjoining neighbors within? 200 square feet of the property? I have. And I sent those certified hearings to, uh, to FAL. Well, 
Was the answer yes? Yes. Yeah, you uh, notified all of your neighbors by certified mail, right? That is correct. Okay. Please, I interrupted you. Go ahead. Uh, just to get up to the grasp on this, if you look at the chart that's in front of there, uh, when you add the building footprints, stairs, pool, patio, driveways, every single item, which would be determined to be an impervious surface area on the entire zoning lot, both buildings and all driveways only constitute 30% of the lot area. That's not building and to, every built surface. To the east of the buildings is your steep slope. Is that correct? That is correct. No, it's actually, it's not to the east, it's to the west because I'm, I'm adjoining the Hudson River. Huh? It's the west side of Palisades and then it goes down towards the oh, Hudson. The, 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 the other right. side, so yeah. The yeah. West, yeah, the railroad yeah, side, the river behind side. the buildings to the west, the area that on is the uh, steep slope. Are there any trees or logs or uh, the like on it? Yes, there are trees in the property. Every one of the little circles you see on this plan is a tree. Let me ask you a question. Is have you personally or has somebody in your employ? Take a look to make sure that now and during the course of construction, there will not be, or you will make every effort to avoid any of those trees coming down on the railroad track or causing problems with the railroad. Well, I, I'm an architect. I'm, I'm not the construction manager, but I will tell you that there are uh methods in place including hay bales and silt fences that will be supplied at the top of the hill where the resident work is not being constructed to prevent any silts or any intrusion into the area where you see the very bold line going down in the latter third of the property that dashed bold line is the area that's being protected and no construction will occur within that. So all the trees that are down slope, as you see indicated on this plan, will be, uh, there will be no work, no construction work occurring anywhere within that area. Now, I'm having a little trouble because of eyesight, nothing else, in understanding where you have the garages for the two buildings, or do you not have an enclosed garage? I have enclosed garages for each, and those are shown and delineated on the site plan that I have up on the screen. They're closer to the street. They would be on the east side of the lot that would be fronting Palisade Avenue. The garages sweep in from the roadways from Palisade and then turn into each respective property. Let me ask you a question. You know that there is a street, I don't believe it has a name, that runs between Palisades and the railroad parking lot, correct? Yes, that is further south of this site. That's what I wanted to find out, okay. It's also pothole filled at all times. Yeah, well, we're we'll 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 that, uh, that, that street or axis. The only one I remember now. Oh, yeah. Chuck, Chuck it, it was recently repaved, by the way. <laughs> was it really? Yes, it was. I was down there a couple of weeks ago and it wasn't. I was down there two days ago. Oh, I know you were. Did you have trouble navigating the rocks? I was surprised, but pleasantly surprised. All right. We had to do some yelling to get them to remove the plants. 
Um, anybody have any other questions? Do you have anything you wish to add? Sir? Uh, I mean, quite honestly, uh, you know, these buildings are significantly less than what the zoning would permit. The intention is to save all the steep slopes. We're not entering into any of them. They're all preserved, including a steep slope buffer, which is the area that runs from the top of the bank of the steep slope, landward for an additional 15 feet. And uh, Department of City Planning has reviewed this. We're actually making minimal grade changes, just assimilating the existing grades into the buildings after construction. Uh, and 70% of the site is being left green. The 30% factor I spoke to you about not only includes the buildings, but every driveway, every impervious surface on the site is added to that number. Uh, if you also look, there are a few uh, larger trees, uh, a few in the front, because the site has already been developed. I mean, it's, it's mainly lawn. Most of the trees are either on the northern edge between the property line, the southern edge, or down slope. And the vast majority of all those trees are being saved. And we even made additional efforts to have the driveways which turn around some of these trees outside critical root zones to be done with uh, uh, porous pavement and to not intrude into the root zones of those trees by going at or above the existing grade. So, you know, a lot of effort has been made to be able to integrate these buildings into the existing fabric. Um, let me give you a personal comment as a person who has some background with the MTA. Um, periodically during the winters, there are concerns as to logs, pieces of trees, rocks and the like coming down those hills, not just on your side, but on the southerly side all the way down. Uh, and that problem has occurred. And it's caused a hell of a problem when you've had a heck of a winter. Um, I would urge you to, in the beginning, take whatever steps you can to secure whatever trees there are, whatever rocks there are and the like, to avoid that happening because it creates an awful situation for an awful lot of people heading to the city and indeed upstate. All right? Okay. Anybody else? On the motion to approve, do I have a second? Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Hands, please. Opposed? Abstentions? Approved. Thank you, sir. Have a good evening. Thank you. The next application is number. Question, I think. Mm -hmm. Want to take a question or no? Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. John? Can you not, sorry, sorry, not a question. We're the next applicant. Oh. oh. <laughs> the next application is LPC application 407 West 246th Street, uh, characterized as an attic addition and rail improvement. Are you the next applicant, sir? Good evening. Yes, I am. I'm John Field from Building Studio Architects. I'm here with Aaron Harris and Jenna Harris. Now I see you, Jenna. They are here. Uh, they're our homeowner. And I can present our present our landmarks presentation by share screen. 
Okay. So this is 407 West 246th Street. Um, it's at the corner of Livingston and 246th Street, Fieldston. We are proposing an attic addition at the rear of the house over a non-historic addition to the original Baum dwelling. This is the original house. Note the original railings. We are also going to be improving the existing railings to more closely uh, match proportions and also provide better height uh, at the front of the building. From the street, the house sits up high um, almost a full story up, uh, so it's a very high sight line. We're looking as you go as you move up to Forty Sixth Street uphill. Let me let me see if I can quickly just get this in focus. You are the corner property on Livingston and Two Forty Six. Is that correct? That is correct. You can see here in orange. We are coming. Once the Barrett House. Am I correct? Yes. Go ahead. Okay. So we are doing railing modifications, as I mentioned, at the low terraces and by the garage. The addition we are proposing is at the attic level uh, in the rear of the house. We are not going above the ridge. Um, one of the things we will talk about is uh, headroom in the attic, which is very minimal. Um, which is why we are going to the ridge. Typically, Landmarks prefers you to set down from the ridge. Okay. So a view from above, the existing house and existing, uh, the existing second floor. We are raising the roof of this area on the second floor, setting it back from the side a little bit. We'll look at that in a minute. Um, and creating an enlarged at attic area for home office and, and play space. This portion of the addition will be visible from 246th Street at the back of the house. Uh, presently, you can see through the trees in spring where there's very few leaves. Um, our rendering shows uh, eave portion, white siding, and then this will be slate roof uh, to help conceal and blend some of this structure uh, and preserve the gable end of the historic house. Sorry, for some reason we are not moving forward. Uh, we built a mock-up for landmarks. So you can see in winter, zoomed in, um, the extent of this mass. It's a little deceptive here because there's an angled line that you see. That's actually the slate roof portion. And this then would be the eave and the clabbered siding portion. Um, as you move up the hill from the sidewalk, we can see um, pieces of it in winter. From the front of the house, um, it's more occluded. And again, our side view rendered. At the rear of the house, which is not visible from the street, um, this is the addition. They're putting room, two rooms upstairs. Um, and it's white clabbered. Uh, the detailing and design of this is consistent with the original bound detailing on the porches. Again, landmarks mock-ups from the rear. Our headroom, you will see, we went to the ridge of the existing attic, uh, gives us seven foot headroom in the attic. Railing modifications um, primarily go towards the original bound design where we have uh, adjusted the proportions of the existing diamonds and also adjusted the capitals of the handrails between. We have done a raised handrail here uh, just to provide code compliant uh, height. Uh, we have lots of details. We have lots of historic plans. Another place we are putting a walk across here, 
across the garage. That slate roof is being removed. It's not historic. Um, so that the mudroom and kitchen can connect to the same level all the way around the house uh, as the as the backyard. Uh, plans, we don't need to go through. Uh, construction drawings, we don't need to go through. Uh, are there questions? David? Uh, yeah, just on 12, you're swapping the door on uh, page 12? On this, the door from yeah, yes. This this door this was approved at staff level. This door there is work. Uh, this house has been under renovation all summer. Jen and Aaron actually have just moved in uh, with their family, um, so we've been doing an interior renovation. This kitchen door was done at staff level. Right, and you removed the door from the the left wing. Correct. There was a door here uh, that was just reconfigured. This door, th there's a now a, a powder room here. And this oh, opens okay. into the existing kitchen. A little brick. Uh, so you've, you've already gone before uh, the LPC staff, and so this, far everything's kosher? Yes, we've been through this extensively with LPC staff. They've been very concerned about the handrails as, at the front. Um, most importantly, um, we've been tweaking that even as we speak uh, back and forth with LPC. And, and what about FPOA? Uh, have they FPOA, seen it? And, and... FP... Sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead. F FPOA has seen this. Uh, I don't have a letter from them, but um, it does go before landmarks and they'll be asked the same thing. So I, I necessarily the same thing. Right. Fieldston regards itself as a world unto itself, <laughs> at least in the city of yes. We have no objection from FPOA. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Do you have an FPOA letter of approval? I do not have an FPOA Hello? letter. I do not. Have you uh, gotten anything from them, or have you said? Have they said anything to you? I have requested a letter from them. I have sent this to them, and they have been typically uh, silent. Perhaps it's because it's All right. when's, when's the board meeting? We'll, we'll assume silence equals acquiescence. Great. Thank you. All right. Anybody else? On the motion to approve, do I have a second? Second. Okay, seconded. Any discussion? Motion. All those in favor, please raise your hands. Opposed? Abstentions? Done. Good luck. Thank you, Mr. Merriba. Thank you very much. You're welcome. All right, next. Uh -huh. Who is here for Hebrew Home? Dan Reingold and other members of the project team. Okay. You're on. Tell us all about this. And since you since most of us have read the Riverdale Press, most of us have zeroed focused issue but go ahead well i'll let um, i'll let uh, jim uh review it thank you all for uh, uh letting us uh, present um we were before the community board uh, the land use committee i believe on june 4th at that time we did go through the whole application um in depth with um the understanding that we were simply waiting to be referred out by city planning um and it was uh, my sense that the that the land use committee was satisfied with the presentation and was just really awaiting 
the formality of the of the referring out, which took place, uh, I believe, yesterday. Um, and uh, so we're here to get this project going because it's been about 11 years and uh, we've got a lot of people waiting to move into the building. So I can with that, I can turn it over to Jim Power, our land use attorney, if you wish, Mr. Chairman, to have the full application reviewed yeah. again or summarized. Dan, can I ask you a question? Um, do you have any plans to construct anything on the site of the so-called Victorian building? No, not to build anything on that where the not on the location of where the house is located on that on the campus. Yes, on this on the uh, campus of the retreat house. On yes. the physical side of it, do you have any plans at all to construct anything at all? Let me tell you why I'm asking you the question. Mm -hmm. Question has, as you've seen, been raised concerning the so-called Victorian building, which some, or at least one person maintains, may have some roots earlier than the Victorian era, but colonial era. Um, and we will probably hear from him in a few minutes. Um, and so, as far as I understand, that is the only new, if you can call it new, um, element to the presentation, because you are correct, you have appeared before, and there were no objections at that time to the application. Now what has happened in between, through no fault of yours, in that it arose just at this stage of the game, uh, we have this additional issue. Um, and so my question was for this purpose. Is it possible, Mr. Powers, to, in effect, bifurcate the approval to approve everything other than this? Hear me out. Other than the Victorian building, which if my colleagues think well of it, and I am of two minds on the issue, um, could then be discussed with landmarks as to whether or not the claims are sufficiently clear to make this a historical structure. So let, let me respond. Uh, Jim, can I respond or did you go want to respond? Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, yeah. So let me just say this, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, 11 years ago, the Hebrew home conducted due diligence and retained a, a, a uh, renowned um, landmark firm, uh, Higgins, to conduct a thorough uh, assessment of the building. And their determination was that the building did not have historic integrity. It had been remodeled and re uh, rebuilt and, and uh, modified multiple times. Um, it, it has zero uh, appearance um, to the original structure that was built in the late 1800s. So although the property itself may have a lot of historic um, elements, the house it does not. And we conducted the due diligence in 2013 um, at some point during this process, this lengthy, lengthy land use process, somebody um, applied for a historic designation at the Landmark Preservation Commission, and no historic landmark status was determined to be uh, appropriate for the, for the house. You have raised two interesting points. One, the material change in the building, and I looked at the building today, and concur that it has had significant change. And number two, number two, you say there was a prior application made to give it designation. Do you have a paper trail for that? Yes. Uh, Mr. Powers, <laughs> when are we going to get that? Uh, just to clarify uh, a point, there was uh, a submission made to the Landmarks Commission back in 2016 in connection with the prior, with the special permit that was ultimately granted. Um, and that included the Higgins and Quaysbarth report. I'm not aware of an actual uh, landmarks designation application that was made. That was an evaluation done in connection with the prior special permit. Do you have any mat material, documentary material that would establish that the issue has been before landmarks? Yes, we do. If I Will can you also provide add that as promptly as possible? Yeah. 
I'm okay. sorry, I just want to introduce Valerie uh, Campbell is uh, also an attorney with the Kramer Levin, a land use uh, expert who uh, was for many years general counsel at the Landmark Preservation uh, Commission. In, in connection with the environmental review of the <clears throat> prior special permit, the commission did not identify the house as a historic resource. And um, in, as part of that review, they were also um, given the research report that Higgins Quaysbarth prepared. And I think the conclusion, certainly in the Higgins Quaysbarth report, was that the house had been very much altered over the years and it did not possess the level of significance that would cause it to be eligible for Landmark's designation. When Landmark's reviewed the prior application, were there any observations, written observations by any members of the commission or of staff as to whether or not this was historic, or did they just not even comment on it? There was a determination by landmark staff that there was this building did not constitute a historic resource. It's, Do you it's, have a it's, written? It's, it's, I think we Do have we a have copy of the writing? form. It's it's not detailed. It's just. Um, Jim, do you have that? Are you able to screen share? Yeah. You can screen share that document with the uh, land use committee. Thank you. Who's sharing? Jim Power. Okay. Give me one second, Jim. Okay. We'll have to just find it. Yes, I have it here on the share. Can everyone see that? Uh, there you go. Yep. Can you read it? Okay. I can't read that. Can I'll read. read I'll read it to you. Right? I'll read it to you there, uh, Mr. Chairman. The landmark print. This is dated. Uh, this is dated um, September seventh, twenty sixteen. Um, the Landmark Preservation Commission is in receipt of additional materials dated September 1st, 2016, regarding identification of architecturally significant properties associated with the project site and study area. There are no concerns. Okay. Thank you. Will you send us a um, hard copy of that tonight, if you possibly can, so we have it tomorrow? Yes. Send it to the board. Yes, we'll Thank you. do that. All right, Mr. Dembowski. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. sir. All right, I'm going to try to share a screen. Can I do that, Farah? Uh, Nick, yes. Let me make you hold on one second, please. More co hosts than. Well, I'm going to remove. <laughs> Okay, are you looking at a picture of a house right now? Yes. Yes. Okay, good. On a so, scale of 1 to 10, it's an 11 that the material above the gables it's on the left was not of Victorian era or let alone colonial. Well, I'm sure that's that's true. <laughs> um, well, let me. I'm not going to take a whole lot of time, but I just wanted to say uh, thank you for giving me an opportunity to speak. I'm Nick Nabowski, president of the Kingsbridge Historical Society, and I watched the recording of the committee's June meeting where I learned of the Hebrew Homes' request for approval for their modification to the <laughs> expansion project to include the demolition of the Victorian home. And that's the name I, I took out of the environmental assessment. I don't think it really had a name prior to that. 
And this was described as a minor modification to the plan. And please correct me if I should be using a different term other no than name. Hebrew home. Is, could I just call the institution the Hebrew home? Sure. So based on my research, I think the site and house might have a much longer and more significant history than anybody knows about. What I'm hoping to achieve here is just to let the community and the members of the committee and the representatives from the Hebrew home know about this history uh, of the property so that they can make an informed decision about its future. And just for background, the Hebrew home purchased these 14 acres in 2011, announced plans to expand the facility, which I think is great. I think they do the most important work and they apparently do a top-notch job of it as well. Um, but the fact that this land is where it is, there were a whole lot of approvals that were needed, including the environmental review. And as part of that expansion in 2016, the Landmarks Preservation Commission requested an archaeological assessment to determine if a more intense archaeological project was warranted. A company called VRB, which, and they they quote the Higgins report, which, which means they reviewed the Higgins report. Um, I personally haven't seen the Higgins report. I'm not sure if that's a public document or not, but uh, I'd love to see it. But a company called VRB performed the archaeological assessment. And this was part of their assessment based on the documentation they reviewed. There is no documentary evidence supporting colonial or revolutionary war activities on the project sites. By the 1800s, however, both sites were being used as parts of residential estates. The estate activities appear to have been non-agrarian. Based on available information, it appears that the project site was owned by James E. Bettner in the early and mid 1800s. Bettner, whose name was applied to the road now called Palisade Avenue, built the main house on the south side in 1842. So just to summarize, 1842 is when they're stating the house was built and that basically they don't delve into anything that may or may not have happened before that on the site. And it was based on that, that report, the archeological assessment that landmarks came back and said what I think you just read, which was that we concur that there are no further archeological concerns for this site. But the problem in my view is that I think the archeological assessments findings are incorrect. There's indeed a colonial and revolutionary history to this place. Um, but the assessment did correctly state that J.E. Bettner was living there in the mid 1800s. Can you see these two maps from the mid 1800s? Yes. Um, and so Hudson River here on the left, you have this dot representing a house labeled J.E. Bettner on both of these maps. You see a, a road, which is the beginnings of Palisades Avenue here. And protruding into the Hudson River is a little bit of Bettner's Dock, as it's labeled in this 1851 map. And here's a later map, again, from the 1800s, 1879, showing Bettner's Dock. Um, there's that early bit of Palisade Avenue there. And there's the Victorian home. But I'm showing you this map for a specific reason, which that is, and this is gonna be probably hard for you to see there in the room, but depicted on the map is a little rivulet or stream or whatever that's draining downhill towards the Hudson River, um, blocked by the railroad in the late 1800s. And I point out that stream because it's depicted in maps from the 1700s, like this one. So this is a map that was, or part of a map um, depicting this area, the, the Southern campus of um, the Hebrew home property. And you'll see, here you got the Hudson River here. You got that little rivulet. And just about in that same relative location, there is a structure indicated labeled Warner. And this map is 1781 drawn by British military engineers for the commander in chief at the time, Sir Henry Clinton. Um, and just above the Warner house, you'll see there's rows of trees and columns, which usually indicates an orchard. 
Now it makes sense that it would be labeled Warner because James E. Bettner, the man who uh, was credited in the landmarks and the um, archeological assessment for building the house, he bought the property from the executors of someone named John Warner. And John Warner, John Warner's uh, executors mapped this property for, um, before selling it to Bettner in 1838. And this is the map they drew, or some engineer drew. <clears throat> and you see, this is 1837. Here's the beginnings of Palisades Avenue. There's that dock. There's the Hudson River. And I want you to keep your eye focused on this structure here indicated and labeled as a dwelling house. Well, this is the contemporary map. Here's your Victorian home. Same thing, Palisade Avenue. Where the dock was, there's still a protrusion into the river. And if you superimpose or switch between the 1837 map and the contemporary map, these maps are geo-referenced, meaning the Palisade Avenue in 1837 is right on top of Palisade Avenue in, in today. The dock, you see where the dock is over here. Whoops, sorry. So there's a, there's a structure in 1837 on the same spot that the Victorian home is today. Um, now, is it possible that James E. Bettner bought this property, demolished the house, and um, built another larger Victorian house right on top of it? That's possible, but it's extremely unlikely. Uh, most often, you'd see a, a builder come and add on to it and make it look Victorian, which is, I think, logically would have happened. And that's very common. I mean, you look at other local landmarks, Wave Hill um, was built in several stages. It doesn't look like the original. Uh, the Hadley House on 251st Street and Post Road, a city landmark building. Most of that was built in the 20th century. It's only a little, the little center core of it that is the original colonial house. There's that dwelling house labeled. And, you know, James Bettner bought of uh, dozens and dozens of acres from the Warners, the, the idea that he would tear down his house to build a new one when he could have built anywhere else on the property is, is a little silly. So who was this John Warner guy who lived here at, at the time of the revolution? In 1776, after fighting broke out between the Patriot forces and the British and the American Revolution, the men of our area elected John Warner to be the captain of the South Yonkers Company. That's This area was part of South Yonkers. And this was quite a revolutionary idea that, you know, fighting men could vote for their officers. That's not the way it worked in the British system. And actually, he was the second elected captain because the first elected captain turned out to be a secret agent working for the British. But John Warner must have been well respected if the men chose to lead him in battle. Now, he didn't own this property until after the war. Before then, he was a tenant farmer who leased his house and land from Frederick Phillips III. Um, and politically, the area would have been called Phillipsburg Manor. And the revolutionary government, the new American government, seized this property from Frederick Phillips. And John Warner was given the chance to buy it. And then it became his just after the war. And he was John Warner wasn't the first Warner to lease this property. His father, William Warner, left his farm in Phillipsburg Manor, AKA Northern Riverdale, to John Warner, according to his 1769 will. William Warner mentions his cows, sheep, horses, farm utensils. Um, so if this is the same property, then there was indeed farming here. And the will also names the women and the enslaved people that lived there as well. John Warner's will mentions the valuable rock quarries on the property. And this property was quarried in the 19th century and the dock was used to ship um, rock, stone down to Manhattan. So basically I think the phase 1A archeological assessment was wrong and asserting that there is no evidence of colonial or revolutionary history on the site. 
It could be one of only a handful of links to that area of our history still in existence. It would be saying something, a statement, for us to demolish it in 2025, exactly 250 years after the outbreak of the revolution, while the rest of the country celebrates that anniversary. Now, do I fault the Hebrew home, the archeological consultants or anyone else not for not knowing this? Not at all. As a local historian, I know exactly where to look for this kind of information. Um, and it's not, not all of it is very easy to find. And of all institutions in the neighborhood, I least want to give the Hebrew home a hard time. because They deserve a lot of praise for the work they do. And I, I think their expansion projects are great. But the stated reason for the proposed demolition of this house is not to build more facilities for seniors. There are no announced plans to build anything at all on the site. The reason given for the intended demolition was that the house has not been lived in since 2011 when it was purchased by the Hebrew home and it has deteriorated. But it doesn't look that bad to me. And I know taking care of historic buildings is costly and difficult. I work at the Van Cortlandt House Museum and the Kingsbridge Historical Society is working very hard to restore its own historic landmark building, Edge Hill. So I know it's not cheap. But the historic buildings of this area are a big part of what makes it special. There are plenty of natural areas with nice rock outcroppings and trees. New York probably has hundreds of square miles of that. But what makes this special is the context, the pairing of the beautiful nature with the beautiful historic buildings in New York City of all places. So I hope that the Hebrew home will reconsider its plan to tear down the house. And I'd be curious to hear what the Hebrew home representatives the committee members and any other community members have to say, and I'd be happy to answer any questions about anything I've been yammering about. Mr. Dombowski, I'm sure I speak for the members of the board and of this committee when I say to you that we thank you for the work you have done, the work you're doing, the concepts that you advocate for are something that are, as you have pointed out, critical to making this a unique community. And on behalf of the community, I thank you, sir. Well, thank you. Now, Mr. Powers, do you have a response of any kind? Uh, <clears throat> yes, I, I would like to say that we have been in this process for a very long time, and it is very important that we keep this project moving and um, through the approvals that we're hoping to obtain this fall from the city planning commission um, and uh, demolition of other parts of the campus is already underway. The construction project is already underway. Nothing has begun until nothing that requires city planning approval uh, has begun yet, but the project is under a very tight time frame, and financing needs to happen very soon. Uh, we, uh, our, our major concern is not to delay the progress of this project. So we would ask the community board to and this committee to continue uh, its uh, uh, review and we believe and hopefully approval of this project in the month of September, regardless of this issue. Uh, let me um, let me put to your uh, thought. All right, you will have no plans to build on this specific site, as I understand it. Therefore, what harm? would you, Hebrew Home, sustain if for a period of, say, six months, you would agree to withhold demolition, destruction, or the like of the building so as to permit those who adhere to the views of Mr. Dembowski have that period of time to petition the Landmarks Commission to see if they have a view. I would tell you, uh, my concern, and that is you underestimate, Mr. Dombowski, the cost of maintenance of one of these things. It's a nightmare and a significant drain on the very limited assets of one of the finest charitable institutions in the city of New York. Um, but do you believe you would sustain any harm or would you like to confer with your clients if you withheld the demolition for six months and we approved everything else? Oh, I believe I, a six-month delay would, would, would have an effect on 
our proposed construction and demolition schedule. But I think, uh, Dan, would you like to weigh in on? Yeah, uh, I mean, first of all, you know, this, I, the project must get approved. We're at the place now where if it doesn't get approved, we have 220 older adults waiting to and move nobody in. Nobody is saying the project isn't going to be approved. Well, the question you know, I have was, to say, Mr. can you Chairman, approve it in its entirety based on a commitment on your part that you will do nothing for six months to give them an opportunity to take whatever action with landmarks they want to on the building? I, I am. I think it would be one component. I think it would be reasonable. You know, I would be willing to consider um, delaying demolition. I think six months is a very long time. It would take us well through financing. It may change some of the lender obligations we have. But I, but I'm, I don't you know, if there, were, what if there is were, the maximum you could buy onto? Let, let's look, talk about a sixty-day period for 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 them to do the work that they need to do. If he wants to evaluate it, will you do will you do ninety days? <laughs> we'll do ninety days. Mr. Dembowski, would you be able within a ninety day period to get this matter to the attention of landmarks and we will endorse I'm being very rash in saying that on behalf of my colleagues, if we were to endorse the expeditious action by the landmarks to make a determination. And the, and the clock starts tonight. We hit the buzzer now and countdown begins. Yep. Yep. And so that's like that's a condition to the approval of the of the modified proposal. Is that how that works? No, you're relying you're relying on what I know to be the good word. Uh, and he keeps his word, Dan Rango. Uh, if he says they're not going to do it for six months, after 90 days, he won't touch it. That is true. Otherwise, I'll go after Mr. Powell. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. I don't, honestly don't know how long it takes to for landmarks to um, look at that sort of thing. But um, I, I, I just don't know how long that, that takes, personally. Can I tell you one crazy notion, Noah, that I heard? Um, a, f a friend of mine in the Historical Society uh, mentioned, well, I mean, have you thought about, you know, at the last meeting you talked about it's not suitable for office space because of all the upgrades it would need. Um, but, it, you know, something like this seems like it could be a, a moneymaker down the, down the road. I mean, think about it being like something like a B&B &B for people coming to visit their relatives at the Hebrew home. Um, let me ask. Let me ask Valerie Mutter Pearl, who is a partner at Perkins Eastman, to weigh in on this. We we've looked at these things. Valerie, could you uh, please respond to that? Sure. Um, you know, we looked at a, a number of uses, uh, re reuses for this um, space, including office space, um, potentially, you know, space for the the, the residents. Um, in addition to the general condition of the building, what it would take to up upgrade um, the and modify the interiors to make it, um, you know, code compliant, not just from electrical and heating, but uh, also accessible. Um, you know, it it becomes overwhelming, and you're you would lose a lot of. Uh, the integrity on the on the inside of the house as well um, as, as and just looking at this picture, you know, you can't even get the, in the front door. So, you know, there are going to be modifications uh, necessary to get people in there, regardless of whether it's, you know, a bed and breakfast or a community center or an office. It, it would take an awful lot to make it code compliant to today's standards. It would be a gut. It would be a gut renovation. Um, I, you know, if, if you, I mean, I've been in that house multiple times. The the passionists completely renovated it in the '60s. You have a, a 1960s kitchen. There's nothing handicapped accessible. Not one thing in the building. There's no elevator. Um, it's it's got a narrow staircase. Um, you know, we we looked at it to say, could we make it a sales office? Could we make it um, a, a guest home? And it would it would be literally cost in the millions of dollars to do it.
the way that would need to be done. And that's money we don't have. The, the outside of the building as well is extraordinarily expensive to maintain as, as, as you can, as you would know as a historian. Um, and, and so this is, um, regretfully, it is, it is a building that, does, that just has no useful purpose for us. And we are not a um, we are a nonprofit organization, as Mr. Merdler identified. Our mission is to take care of older adults. We are not historic preservationists. It's not what we do. Um, so, you know, are, are we willing to take a, a pause and 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 let landmarks weigh in? Um, we will, but it's got to be a pause that is a, a very abbreviated. In fairness, we've been we we provided due diligence about this issue 13, uh, 11 years ago. Um, along the way, Mr. Merdler has invited members of the community to meet, reach out to us, to participate with us, to discuss issues with us. This is coming up not at the 11th hour, at the 12th hour. So again, I respect uh, the, the historic uh, research you've done. It's fascinating. I, I love American history. Um, the building is not necessarily part of that history. Uh, this is not the building that Mr. Warner built. This is a building that's been added on to, uh, modified at least three or four times um, since 1920. So we're not looking at a building. And, you know, if we have to wait for Landmarks Preservation Commission to make that determination, we'll wait 90 days to do it. I think that's fair, but not hold up this, not hold up the approval. It won't. Uh, I don't think. Who else? Uh, wait, let me see if there's anybody on the board who is Bob Bender. Yeah, I, um, everything that everybody is saying makes perfect sense. What concerns me is that if there is, if there is no reason why anything has to be done to this property imminently, uh, no construction is going to be done there. The only issue is when will it be demolished? Uh, I don't understand the urgency whether it's 90 days or six months. I don't know how long landmarks would take to review it. Uh, but, I, you know, a very interesting question has been raised, and if in the end the Landmarks Preservation Commission says, as I suspect they might, that the property has been so altered uh, that the house has lost its historic significance, then it can be demolished at that point, whether that's 90 days from now or six months from now. Nobody's asking the Hebrew home to raise money to preserve the house. If it turns out that the house, according to Landmarks, does have some value, uh, Nick is going to have to figure out uh, if, if he wants to preserve it, how, uh, where to find the money, how it's going to be done. And I know Nick is very good at that, but he's already got one property that he's working on. So I, I don't really see the downside to allowing sufficient time for the Landmarks Preservation Commission to weigh in and make its determination. If it takes six months, I don't think that's unreasonable. All right. Uh, there's a gentleman on the top. Well, Karen was first. Oh, all right, Karen. Hi, everybody. Um, oh, hold it, Mr. Wolpoff. Okay. As I listen to all of this, I'm reminded, sadly, of the uh, mansion on the Delafield estate. Left to its own devices, it disappeared. Um, this house as well-intentioned as the Historical Society may be. We've listened to a number of, 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 of possible uses that didn't seem to work. I would think that the Historical Society ought to think about not just whether or not this is historical, but what they would do or could do to relieve the Hebrew home from having to spend funds it doesn't necessarily have to maintain this house before it becomes the mansion on, uh, on Delafield. Anybody else? Laura. Uh, yeah, in uh, the literature we got from uh, Nick, it says, contrary to what was stated in both the, uh, this is being done at a last minute modification to their plans and contrary to what was stated in both the environmental review and the zoning permit application. Did you comment on that? So this was not in anything original that we voted on? We have, it was not part of the package we voted on some years ago. Uh, this has been before this board in one form or another. This current application. 
for months on end. Uh, Mr. Rheingold and members of his team have been before the board on at least one lengthy occasion. I have had conversations with them, I can't tell you how many times, about different aspects of getting this thing done. Uh, the question really here is the old doctrine of last clear chance is either, you know, I, I come to it this way, so let me tell you why I do this. I would hate to be in a position, and I think many of you would hate to be in the position where if on the day after it disappears next week, we find out that indeed this was a very key facility in the revolution, uh, and landmarks have some records of it, and they didn't do that kind of focus before. The likelihood of that happening, in my view, is none. But the fact is, I'd hate to deprive them of a chance. I think uh, Mr. Reingold is being generous in saying he would agree to several months to withhold the demolition, subject to our approval of the rest of it, or the, all of it. Um, and he would do that as a matter of comedy and uh, pr his own solid word. But to Bob's point, I agree with Bob Benda. He said, you know, they're not building on it, so what is the rush to demolish? When you have a contractor, when you have a contractor, and you have a contract out for a series of items of work, and you have a phased schedule as they have here. You change that schedule. You pay for it. And that's what they're doing. That's right. So there's a cost right. to them, to them being the Hebrew home. Um, but Mr. Uh, Mr. Rangold said he would give it 90 days. Uh, if you would agree, and I don't presume to say whether you will or will not, but if you would agree, and the 90 days were to hold, uh, I would join with Mr. Dembowski in asking Landmarks to do this on an immediate basis, and I would make a few calls to encourage them to do it. And I think probably our elected officials would join in that. The, Karen, you're on. Yes, so I just like to, um, I agree with what almost everybody's saying, and I just like to uh, bring up another point, which is, it was not checked off on the EAS. It was not reviewed in the in the archeological study. So technically they had a conditional neg deck. It seems like based on that, they might end up having something that is an impact and it was never looked at because they thought there was nothing there. And so I will say that, you know, we have environment, we have, a weak environmental protection going on to begin with. And the fact that this was not even to be thought of as being done. And now it is sitting there with, I mean, I saw the deed from, I don't know, 1730 something. I forget the date of the deed, the original deed. And they got, he paid in pounds. It was before we had money in this country. It, would, it was before we, we were a country. At the very least, it would be important to know what was going on there and memorialize it. And I would think that the Hebrew home would love to do that because that will be something that people will come to see. Now, whether the house is adequate to be retained, that's another story. But I think I've read many environmental impact statements. I didn't know the Jerome Park Reservoir was eligible for the state and natural and, and national um, historic preservation until they did the EIS. And I am shocked that the people that did your EAS did not include that in the original EAS. And don't forget, it also had a conditional negative deck, which was sort of, because it was about transportation was one thing, but if there is an impact, we really need to be looking at that. Thank you. Mr. McGuire. Yes. Thank you. I just wanted to jump in with some peanut gallery here. I actually have been before the Landmarks Commission on projects of my own 
And um, I can tell you from personal experience that uh, my lawyer whispered in my ear, these people do exactly whatever the blank they want. And that's really the essence of scheduling down at Landmarks. Um, people who can call and encourage them to do this expeditiously, um, that, that would be wonderful if it works, because uh, I've seen what happens when the right person calls. Um, I've also watched uh, an engineering company turn a, a color that I've never seen a human turn while Landmarks was just pivoting around what they might think a design would look like and would you try to do it again? We don't know what we want, but we'd like you to try again. Well, and see let me be matter. rude and interrupt you. I'm Our sorry. Experience, let me be rude and interrupt you, if I may. Our experience with Landmarks has consistently been cooperation to the nth degree and then some. Of all of the city agencies, I probably would view them as the single most cooperative. Well, I can tell you my project went straight through. I, I w had the exact same experience, but I watched the I watched 60 Hudson Street twist in the wind trying to get the building done. <laughs> so anyhow, it, it can go both ways. Uh, six months is probably uh, quite generous towards landmarks. I, I don't know that you could guarantee 90 days or 60 days that they would even review it in that time. Uh, and that would probably require Nick to show up in the peanut gallery there um, at several of the monthly meetings. Jody. Okay, thanks, Ms. Chuck. Um, um, 90 days is kind of the equivalent of about 10 days since we are heading into Jewish holidays, Thanksgiving, Christmas, many people are away. It is very difficult to get anything done in a city agency unless, as Mr. McGuire mentioned, unless someone like the mayor wants something pushed through. <clears throat> so um, I am very confused considering that this house wasn't included in the original plan to be demolished. What such a rush is, and how that would interfere with them building 200 plus luxury units. This isn't affordable senior housing. This is promoted as luxury living with, you know, buy-ins of half a million dollars for the insurance program and $5,000 a month maintenance. So I, I really haven't heard a, a clear answer from Mr. Reingold or the Hebrew Home Team about what the rush is if this was not part of the original Sorry, project. There's a, there's a contractual schedule for the demolition and construction. It's been produced to us. Yes, if I understand they that. They defer but... one portion. They're going to have to deal with the contractors and see if they can get them to move the other one up and do it. Yes, that I is expensive. I understand that scheduling, but this is new information and a step was skipped. The, the uh, Phillips Manor is a, a state historic park. Um, I discovered that recently when I went for a tour there. So if this has any connection to Phillips Manor and Yonkers um, and is part of their history, I don't, you know, there are many ways if there was a will um, to do this, to get this done. And I would hope that the Hebrew home would use their considerable clout to um, encourage this to be moved up on the docket for a serious review by Landmark. Nick has done an amazing amount of research in a very short time. Imagine, and he's a volunteer, imagine if a paid someone like Higgins and Quaysbarth had done the diligence that he did what they would have found if they looked and for us to not look like you said it would be a shame to find out later when it's being demolished oh my gosh there's pre-revolutionary war things here 
So, um, you know, I think six months is not enough time. I understand you have schedules, but um, I think that there needs to be a will to expedite this for a real serious review, not just a rubber stamp. So let me let me weigh in here. Um, this has not been something that has been done expeditiously. Eleven years ago, without any conversation from the community, we undertook at our own expense a due diligence investigation of the property. And what I will say to you is that I completely rely and trust the Higgins review that this does not have historic integrity. The property may be historic. The, the, the conveyance of the real properties may have taken place in the 1700s or the 1800s, but this house was not there. This is not the house that was built. This is not the house that was that exists in the format that it existed in back then. It has been added to, modified multiple times. That's been discussed. The fact that they were coming up at not the 11th hour, but the 12th hour and bringing this issue up is really unfair to the Hebrew home. We've been we've been nothing but transparent and compliant. So I do have to push back on any suggestion that we've been, been doing something quickly or at the last minute. We looked into this building when what, what changed is the fact that our construction um, team came in and said, in order to demolish things the most effectively, the least amount of disruption to our neighbors, which is another concern that we've accommodated over the years, is to do this in a sequence that makes sense. And that's the sense of urgency, that it be done along with while they're staged, while the demolition is taking place, for them to go away and have to come back and start all new demolition will cost a fortune of money. And so there is a sense of timing. I think that coming up with a three month delay is reasonable. The amount of work that Nick has done in, in the, I guess in the last few weeks indicates that there's time to, that it can be done. Um, as far as our ability to push landmark preservation, I don't think we have. I wish I could tell you that we could get the city to move quickly, but you can tell from this application that we have been, this, this process has taken years. And here we are, it's showtime. And I, again, I've agreed to a 90 day delay um, to see whether there's any indication that this is historic. I do not believe there'll be anything historic about the house, even though there may be historic aspects to the property, but we're willing to wait 90 days. And, and I think that's a very fair response and reasonable response to this last minute request. Ms. Campbell. Yes, hi. I just wanted to say a few words about the landmarks process. And um, I think 90 days is an adequate amount of time. Um, first, they have already reviewed this property. Um, they've reviewed the Higgins Plays Barth report. Um, so they have records on it. It's not anything new. This is also a review that happens at staff level in the research department. Um, it's overseen by the executive director and the chair. It does not require um, a public hearing. So there is time um, within the 90 days for the commission staff to review the additional information. All right, Mr. Dembowski. Um, I just want to say I do feel your pain on the construction schedule. I'm sure I seem like a huge pain, <laughs> a huge thorn in the side at this time. Um, but um, you know, it wasn't the demolition of this house. I I only heard about the the proposed demolition recently, like shortly before I wrote that blog post, um, because you know it wasn't in the environmental review. And the original architectural assessment indicated it wasn't going to be torn down. And I think if it if the original plan was to tear down the house, I think maybe the archaeological assessment would have maybe taken a little closer look at it, honestly. Um, I mean, I would push back on the idea that Higgins Clark, the, the Higgins um, uh, Quays Barth report, um, which is not public as far as I understand. I think that's a private document that only, I think the Hebrew home and maybe landmarks has seen, but I've, I've never seen it, but the public archeological assessment does uh, quote that report and there are footnotes that refer to that report. And the, Hig and the Higgins report says that the building was built in 1842. So, I mean, if I think that does meet the definition of historic. If, if we think Wave Hill is historic, 
which was built at the same time where we think the Bartow Pell Mansion is historic. Mr. Dombrowski, I don't, I don't think, I, I look in fairness, they, whether the house was built hey, in 18... Hey, hey, please, please, please. One more, and that's the end of this discussion. Ms. Rudell, is it? Yes, sir. Hi. Um, I just wanted to weigh in. Abby Rudow, um, I'm from VHB who undertook the environmental analysis um, and the the uh, archaeological analysis back in 2016. I've heard a couple of times that the, the environmental review didn't reference historical property, so I just wanted to correct the record on that that was based on the lpc review of all of the buildings on the property back in the two during the 2017 eas that was done so when environmental documents that were uh the, the environmental review that was done associated with this application was based on the original review from lpc so i just wanted to correct the record um it's, it's not that anything was hidden from this board, uh, you know, it, it was based on an original LPC review of the architectural resources on the property. Thank you. All right. So now we have heard from everybody. In a few moments, I'm going to ask you, members of the committee. Where did you have your hands up? Uh, I figured it out. Thank you. Okay. Um, One more hand. No, 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 no. That we're done with that. So where we are at the is at the following moment is if I could persuade my friend Mr. Reingold, a very decent human being, who has done an absolutely superb job in bringing the Hebrew home to where it is today, and will be tomorrow. If January 1 would be a very good cutoff date and say that that would be the period of time they have to act by, it's a little more than 90 days, but not a hell of a lot more, like two weeks more. Uh, if he were to agree to that, would the consensus of the committee, which I'll take separately as a vote, would be to approve the application in its entirety, and we would rely on Mr. Reingold's word and that of the team of the Hebrew home that they would not do anything between now and then. Is that something that the committee would be prepared to go along with? Anybody? If you're asking, yes, I would. I think that's a fair, uh, a fair request. Okay. Marty, anybody else? Anybody disagree with that? All right, back into you, Dan. That's, January that's, 1. That's fine. On the motion to approve the application subject to the delay as to only this one site in demolition, all those in favor, please raise your hand. All those opposed? One. All those abstaining. Two. What's the vote? Or one, two. Hills. Yes. Oh, it passes. Four, one, six. two. It's four, four to three. Out six, okay. Four out of six, right? Four out of seven. No, four out of seven. Four. Four, seven. four. Yep. four approved, right? Yep. Four, three, Done. All right, Dan. Now it has to go to the board tomorrow night. Right. Uh, Mr. Murdler, if I could uh, just interject one more uh, point. We had requested that the board consent to an amendment to a restrictive declaration on the South Campus, just reflecting a change in the site plan. We would ask that that be incorporated into the resolution of approval. What would you want us to amend it to read? Uh, that the community board eight. Uh, agrees to the requested modification of the restrictive declaration to reflect the updated site plan consistent with this application. All the, any discussion? On the motion to approve? Do I have a second on the motion to approve? Any discussion? All those in favor, please raise your hand. Same thing. Four, 
All those opposed? All those abstaining? Three. Both aspects are passed. Dan, I thank you. I appreciate it. I thank you. And we and we appreciate the uh, the historic investigation. It's just, you know, it's the frustration, but we do appreciate it. Um, and we will comply with any requests that LPC makes of us. Thank you. Zambowski, will you please do this for us? Would you please get to the board office by no later than Friday a formal request on behalf of the Historical Society to Landmarks advising them that uh, Hebrew Home has agreed to do for demolition of this one portion uh, until January 1, and that we would ask them on an urgent basis, the society would ask them on an urgent basis to examine whatever historical question you would pose them. If you get it to us by Friday, I will send, add my letter of endorsement of it, if the chair will permit that, and we will deal with it at the board meeting tomorrow, or whenever it is. And I will place whatever calls have to be placed. Can you do that? Yes. And I also, Mr. Reingold, if you ever want to have someone visit and do a historical society lecture for the seniors at the Hebrew home, I'd be happy to do that. I've done it at Riverdale Senior Center. People get a kick out of it. I'd be happy to do that up there. Thank you. Tara. I just want to make sure you're voting. There were two applications. One was for the permit renewal, yep. and one was for the modification. Correct. And, and both then vote you also them. had the restricted declaration. Right. So you voted on two items. Right. Over. Four to three on the okay, second. Is there a third no. part of this you have no. to vote on? I don't think there's a third part. All right, Mr. Chairman, do you need anything uh, from us in writing um, uh, confirming our agreement to delay demolition until January 1st? Or do you if want you to can, then that? that would be appreciated. Uh, so, uh, Jim, would you please forward something to the Land Use Committee just yes, establishing okay. that we've agreed to January 1st to at least to wait? Yeah. Yes, ma'am. That was a long conversation. I want to make sure that I have the notes that are that reflect what actually happened. So the motion was essentially to modify, or sorry, to go ahead with like the demolition and all of that stuff. And you voted four to three that they can go ahead with it, but there's a January first deadline specifically for uh, doing an investigation into the home. Specific. The they have agreed. Yeah to defer demolition on just this one structure yeah. until January 1. Everything else is, is done. done. Okay, thank you. The next item on the agenda, and thank you very much, Dan. Thank, thank, thank you. you. And you, Mr. Dembowski. All right, the next one is mine. We have had a period of time in connection with the, with the City Planning Commission, which I find extremely troublesome. Um, this board, at the request of the community, took up recently an application that sought on a building that was located on a corner adjacent to three well-traveled streets to expand to make it a school, we opposed that application. City planning approved it. I have no knowledge, even though we opposed it. Has anybody ever got in touch with the board on that? Has anybody ever told the board it was coming up? Has anybody ever paid any attention to the board? Nope. This is not new. We've got the same problem consistently with respect to SNAD. We have it again in a renewed SNAD matter, which will come up in a few minutes. It seems to me, and it seems to the leadership of several other community boards in the city, that the time may have come to take a good hard look at how planning is done in this town by way of the charter 
to take a good hard look at a change in the City Planning Commission and how it functions, just as one hypothetical. At the present, City Planning Commission is now, as it has been for years, totally in the hands of the mayor of the city of New York. There was a time, under John Zuccotti and some others, where there was a cooperative feeling as between the community boards, which were then known as community planning boards, and city planning. And city planning was the strongest ally of the boards, and the boards were the strongest ally of city planning. Rosemary Ginty was on the staff of city planning when I first met her, I don't know how many years ago, decades ago. So that what was isn't. And my impression as somebody who's been in city government and is today functioning in city government, that city planning as is currently constituted, I don't give a damn about us except as a statutory obligation. So that you have the constant struggle, it's always been here, between centralized government and decentralized government. And one approach that another board has suggested is that they provide that each borough have a planning commission of its own, and the members of that commission should be part of the city planning commission, and that issues that are citywide should go there, and that issues that are borough-wide should at least in the first instance be handled on a borough level. That the borough levels have, as their members of their commission, led by the borough president, should have the community board chair as part of that commission board, so that we get to the grassroots. Maybe that's a lousy idea, maybe it's a great idea. And what I would like to ask you today is to uh, give me your views as to whether or not we can have a task force take a good hard look at that and cooperate with the other com uh, community boards that want to do it. Some of them have proposed the idea of having a charter amendment to effectuate that. But before you do anything like that, I think we need to take a look at how best you can return the City Planning Commission to an entity that is responsive to the people in the community. In a town that today is well on its way to having the most corrupt government in the history of the city of New York, it's about right. time we did something like that. Boss Tweed? <laughs> well, he, they challenge him. Yeah, I will give you the name of this current Boss Tweed off the record. Um, but in any event, you're right as usual. Uh, so do you have a view that's worth having such a task force? Uh, yeah, yeah, let, let me... Chuck, you and I and Laura and, and David and, and Marty remember when somebody from uh, city planning came to the board meeting right. yes. every month, which has not happened for several years now. Correct. Um, it, it, that seems to me one barometer of the relationship between city planning and the local community boards. So I think something that, that can move us back in the direction of uh, some dialogue between the community boards or let's say a more productive dialogue between the community boards and city planning is a good idea. And this sounds to me, based on what you've just described, as though it moves us in that direction. Thank you, Bob. Anyone else? Then may I assume, please, that the consensus is that we may go forward. I will consult with the chair and we'll put together a task force. If there's anybody particularly wants to work on it, please let me know. All right? Yes. Uh, what, people in the task force, what would they do? Well, that depends on how, the, the idea is to take a good hard look, talk among ourselves as to what it is, and then submit a report, which is basically what Julie had us do on the housing city of Yes. I'm looking at it the same way. And the additional part is communicating with the other uh, community boards. All right, we will go down that road. Um, Islin Avenue. LPC 24-05229 is an application that involves uh, Islin Avenue 
746 this week. Um, to, to do this for October? Is that the window? I'm sorry? Is this a window violation? Yes. Or are you just going to discuss it? I'm going to just tell, report to them because I think it's important. Um, we had this matter. There was supposed to be a series of windows put into the building that were, I think they're called six over four or six over Six over one. Six over one. I am advised by the architect for the project that they ordered the windows, and instead of they coming in a six over one, they came in four over one, and he would now like to see us modify our approval so that they could take what they got. That sort of gives me some qualm in terms of where it is, and I want to see where you folks are. Any views? It's, it's Mark, so they're very mm -hmm. specific on the Couldn't he get one whoever one. sold them to him to just give them the ones that they actually ordered? <laughs> yeah. That's what he wants. <laughs> yeah. Oh, to get the uh, vendor. The manufacturer. Somewhere, whoever manufactured them and sold them the wrong windows. Mm -hmm. I agree. Why not reject them and ask for the right windows? I'm sure they would if we turned this down. Mm -hmm. Assuming mm -hmm. that they in fact ordered six over one. Mm -hmm. I am advised by the architect, and I'm prepared to take his word on this, that uh, that's what happened. I'd love to see pictures of both. At the moment, uh, we're not prepared to sign off. Is that your I view? No idea with six over one. Right. I mean, we certainly have to see pictures. Pictures. The bottom one is a giant pane, and up above you have small panes. That's all it is. You have six on the top, and you have one big one down below. You're talking about the front. Yeah. Similar to this, if you see, I think. What was it supposed to be? Supposed to be six over one, and they gave him four over one. Right. So why is he willing to accept the incorrect? That's a great question. Because, like Marty said. <laughs> okay, I got the message. We will not act on this matter at this time. Okay. So what is the result? You want pictures of mm -hmm. it? or no. It ain't going to happen. Okay. So we're not going to sign... Um... No. Okay. I don't think there's any enthusiasm to do that. <laughs> Am I, if anybody disagrees with me, speak now or forever I will curse you. <laughs> uh, old business. We have a recurring problem on SNAD in Scenic Place area. About three or four years ago, Rosemary Ginty, who was then on this committee, and who knows more about zoning than any person I know, uh, who came from city planning, became the mayor's assistant for housing and zoning, and then the archdiocese expert on it after serving at the Bronx, uh, I think it was the botanical gardens expert, uh, and having served as my law partner and gone to law school first to do it. Um, we went there. I was there too. You were there too. That's right. <laughs> And they were hit next door to this building that's involved here. They were hit for doing even less. Farah and I went to this building. What has happened? What? I'm just going to interrupt. Are you homeowner from the building, yeah. right? Is here today. Sure. So, you just saying that. 3040 Scenic? Yeah. 3040 Scenic, please. <laughs> How long have you been there? I bought the house last summer. Oh, okay, because I remember the renovation. I, I live in at 2621. I was about. looking hey. for him. I didn't know who was here. I know. I was okay. looking up here. <laughs> All right. So they were hit by, landmark, by city planning and the building department, and a building inspector issued a violation of what they were doing, which is lesser, not in terms of what specific vegetation or the like was involved, but a much smaller area was involved in what they were doing. For whatever reason, um, they have been quite, there's a strained relationship between neighbors here. Uh, and it transcends this issue 
and goes to a whole bunch of other issues. Um, we got a complaint that what was being done was A, change in topography, B, uh, removal of vegetation, and this, by the way, is a steep slope area as well, and it's directly adjacent to the water. Scenic Place is the last piece of property before you hit the water, okay? Um, the Hudson River. And thirdly, uh, that there were topographical changes. Uh, Farah and I went to see it, and I photographed it. Uh, to my eye and to my lens, I saw at least one branch with some leaves on it, a bunch of logs, but the branch and the leaves looked like they came from a tree, and I have the photographs and sent them in to show that. Veget I'll pack it with the pictures. Oh, okay. And number two, there was some removal activity in the back, and they took out all of the vegetation. And you will hear in a few moments what that vegetation was. And there has been a change in the site in terms of when they removed that. It looks like there has been a bulldozer of some sort in the backyard. Um, again, this is directly adjacent to the tracks of Metro North. So it runs right down the hill to it. What is going on next door is a very, very extensive and what may be very well be one of the most attractive buildings around being built on the site. Um, we have, I asked, linked with the owner, who I'm delighted to see, uh, and he told me the following. One, with respect to the trees, there were no tree removal coming on. There were logs on the site from old trees that had come down, and there were no tree removals, that they had charted each of the trees that were on the site, and they matched what was required and approved by city planning in the review. Two, that the vegetation was invasive vegetation that the Wall Street Journal and other sources have recently described as so invasive as to be a serious problem. And they were doing the world a great favor doing it, and they're going to proceed it and do some things with it. And three, that there has not been any meaningful change of the topography uh, that would not have happened if they were using just a lawnmower to take that stuff off, but they couldn't. Uh, and a building inspector came to the site, and the building inspector said no violation of SNAD. Now, I do not credit that building inspector, so we're clear, because his predecessor said exactly the opposite when the same thing was done next door. So I, I, I sort of wonder. Um, but that's building inspectors, um, subject about which I can go on at enormous length on the basis of personal knowledge. Um, so there it is, and since the owner's here, what did I om omit? Um, I think you adequately stated everything. Um, I think there's, if I say share things that I shouldn't share, just shut me up, and I won't share it. I think there's a background here of tension between neighbors. Um, I have one neighbor who is very upset at us moving in and doing renovations. Um, I have two other neighbors who are delighted that we're moving in and are very happy that we're restoring the property. This property had fallen into disabandon. So much for the one of my neighbors. There's an area on the bottom left of my property. It's forested. And, um, no one was taking care of it, and one of the trees actually fell down and crushed the neighbor's house because the old previous owners were elderly and they kind of neglected the property. Not kind of, they neglected the property. Um, 
we are a young family, four kids, and uh, we're coming in, and we're, we filed with the CPC. A little background on myself. I moved to the community 18 years ago. Um, I volunteered on a project called the Hudson Greenway Project, which some members in this, did that for about five years. Some members in this room were on that committee with me. Um, I fell in love with the Hudson Greenway. Um, and since then, it was my dream to buy a house on the river. Um, I started my business in Riverdale. And um, when I was fortunate enough to be able to buy a home, uh, Phoenix Place stole my heart. And my intention is to make it into a beautiful way hill for my family. Um, there is something called Japanese knotweed on the property. It is highly invasive. It attacks trees. It attacks everything around it. I hired an arborist. I hired a landscape architect to diagnose all the species in the backyard. Um, I have letters that I provided, um, and I have everything here. Um, and we removed the Japanese knotweed, and um, we're going to be planting a grass, a grassy area, and something called fescue, which is like a tall grass, which is native to the area. There's no development going on on the site. There are no structures being built. No topography being changed. If I would welcome anyone here who wants to come to my backyard. I'm happy to walk them through it and uh, show them the property and show them what we hope to do. Our aim is moving in February, and I'm here to address any questions, any concerns of the community board. So, the issue before you tonight is really whether we take this any further. Uh, we're either uh, bringing it to the attention of city planning or otherwise. Um, question. First of all, um, Maybe I missed it, but what's your name? Joey Baum, Joseph Baum. Okay. All right. Uh, um, yeah, I didn't want to call you by your uh, house number. Uh, <laughs> Mr. Senek. Okay, right, 3040 Senek. Um, now, there's a, there's a big uh, dirt area where obviously plants have been removed. That's the Japanese knotweed right. that you and took out? More. There's still more of it, mm -hmm. and I stopped because I wanted mm -hmm. to see, you know, I don't want to cause more trouble before we settle. What you've already done, right. What's already been done. Mm -hmm. um, but it's all over, just not my property. So mm -hmm. there's a, I have a neighbor, I don't know if she's on the call, her name is Betty Klein, also on 231st Street. She's there. Oh. Mm -hmm. um, so it's all over her backyard as well. Japanese island is so bad that in the UK, by the way, you are not able to get a mortgage on your house. Mm -hmm. if they have, if, if not weed is found on your property. It is not natural to New York City. It was mm -hmm. imported. So that's what I call Japanese knotweed, um, and it's grown out of control. And so on, on that uh, open area right now, that's going to be entirely fescue? The ridge, so there's a pool, right? Like a pool area. And, and there's a ridge. A small ridge, maybe right. 10 feet, 15 yeah, feet. Yeah, I saw it. Mm -hmm. That's going to be fescue. Mm -hmm. The flat area is going to be grass. Okay. And that's it. Okay. Thank you. And by the way, so the tree count was all done for city planning. And you can walk the property with me. All the trees are still there. No trees have been taken down. Um, and I'm happy to show everyone the logs that are on the ground that we discovered after we moved the vines. I asked Mr. Bohm to submit to the office, and I believe the, he has done so. Correct me if I'm wrong, somebody. Three things. One, a letter from an arborist attesting to the nature and invasive nature of this mountain, whatever the hell it's called. Two, that some evidence to show, some attestation to show that there are no trees that were removed, that while there are visible lots of tree remnants there, and I'm going to talk to you about that publicly at the moment we get through this. Um, that there were no new trees or protected trees removed. And three, that there has been no topographical change. And have you filed all of that stuff? Yes. Mm -hmm. So here's the logs that are piled up that you're referring to. Yeah, they have a picture that's different. Than this that. is different. This okay. will show you. I think the chairman was concerned that he saw some leaves coming out. Mm -hmm. You can clearly see these are from dead branches. They're not attached to the logs. 
This is from the arborist certifying that the logs found on the floor are from long dead trees, rotted wood. Um, this is a letter from an arborist, um, Bartlett Tree, who does a lot of work in the community, talking about the Japanese knotwood in the area. These are the CPC plants with the topography and the 145 trees, no, 100 and, it is a, those are tree credits, sorry. Um, 46 trees on the property that you can walk around and we can count them all together. Nothing has changed. And you can see the topography of the property, the ridge, flat area, the divot in the middle, and then the steep ridge down to the railroad. So nothing has changed. The only thing that's changed is you now can see the ground because the knotweed has been removed. That's the only thing. So, so let me deal with the one thing. Whatever happens here, mm -hmm. please, at your earliest convenience, yes, before the winter really sets in, have all dead materials removed because you are right near the edge of the area and it can fall on the railway tracks. I want to address that point. I spoke to the Metro North today. Um, the inspector came out two weeks ago and I spoke to him again today and he confirmed that, I, that everything that's done on the property is not a concern for the railroad. Um, he signed it off by his bosses. I'm happy to give the gentleman's phone number to you if you would like to speak to him yourself. I would love to remove the debris, trust me, if you can help me with my neighbor um, to get one access. Thing, one thing has nothing to do with the other. Why would the neighbor have a problem removing it? Um, I don't want to mix the conversation. Okay. So, all right. talking about on her side of the property. Oh, oh. They, oh. Didn't, they say that they did not want them to okay. touch anything. And there's a bit of a retaining wall uh, from the tracks. I mean, walk the tracks, actually. Correct. So there's... I mean, that's down, 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 below, yeah. down, down, down the ridge, right? So, I mean, officially, there's 231st. My property board is 231st, and the easiest way to get the debris out would be go up 231st instead of carrying it through the property, through the house, into the street. The neighbor, at this point in time, does not want me accessing that easement on our property. Uh, I think legal... No, okay. okay. Anybody have any... Thing to say or add to this discussion, Mr. Walpole. Just out of curiosity, we visited the corner house when it was first being the next, right next to that, oh, in the map. Um, and so, you are removing the material, or have removed the material, in back of your house. Don't you have easement along the side of your house to remove stuff? The dispute yes. between them has accelerated to who has that easement, what is the scope of the I'm easement. I'm trying to the topic just very focused on the complaints. I would be happy to expand on that in a different meeting. I don't want to waste the, meet the board's time. So what, what are we being asked to do? I remember that first house gave us problems from the beginning. Right. And so... <laughs> If we say remove, how does that change the equation? It doesn't. It was just my concern for MTA because the logs coming down from that hill, the dead trees, the rocks coming down, have on more than one occasion knocked out the line to travel to and from the city of New York. Laura. Um. I'm impressed that things are in order. I'm sorry? I'm impressed that th things appear to be in order. I'm not familiar with the original complaint of what he's responding to, but I am impressed with the amount of paper and everything else, and I, I, it sounds to me like everything is in order. Anybody else? Yeah. Yes. Uh, uh, Joey, I, um, I said you were a frequent visitor. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I'm actually the, the closest board member to, to your property. I live, you know, basically a block and a half away. Um, and I'm very familiar with the previous problem. Uh, not to get too deep, but the, the difficult neighbor is that the one immediately north and, and east of you 
Because that's the one who yes. created the problem yes. last time. Yes. Okay. All right. I, I don't need you to get any deeper. But I think that has implications to this discussion. I think they're pissed off because we stopped them eight years ago. Yep. I also have pictures of the fallen logs from wintertime when the leaves weren't on the trees so you could see the logs. If, and these are two letters from my other neighbors in case the board wants to read them. And they're on the call. Is there anyone else who wishes to be heard on this subject? Hearing none, we will move on to the most important item of the evening. The motion to adjourn. <laughs> <sighs> oh, time out. Second most important. Um, we have a resolution. First, I'd ask you to approve in a minute a motion to, to amend the agenda to listen to this motion. It is a motion by the uh, chair of this committee and the chair of the board. A resolution to amend, proposing the amendment of the city zoning ordinance to include community board offices in residential locations. Because we cannot locate in what is described as a residential location, we have been trying since what, 2017 to get new office space in an area convenient to everybody, preferably in the center of the community board district. And every time we've come up on something, looked halfway interesting, it's part of a residential area. That's the predominant nature of this community. And so the only way that the city can permit us to take space in the area is if the zoning resolution were amended to allow for that, failing which the only other way is an application for a variance for the Board of Standards and Appeals, which takes a year, if you're lucky, to get through. Um, I'm... Is Randy Mato still on? Up left. Randy, are you there? Yes, I am. I am. This is the chief of staff to Assemblyman Dinowitz, who is always on the ball, as is Randy. Randy, this is going to be an amendment proposed to amend the city charter, which is an Eric issue, and I don't see Eric or any member of his staff. But uh, if it is passed and both... Julie and I are co-sponsoring this resolution so that we can broaden the provisions of the uses permitted under the zoning resolution in residential areas so that community boards can be located there. It does nothing else but that. Happy to help. Okay. First, let me ask for a second to a motion to amend the agenda of the meeting to hear this application. Do I have a second to my motion? Second, sir. Any discussion? All those in favor, hands please. Contrary-minded, abstentions unanimous. Second, the resolution, after it's here and there are copies for each of you. Uh, what it does is no more than what I've just said. Okay. So, can I ask for your approval of that? I so move that the resolution be approved, so that we ask for an for the uh, city charter to be amended to do, a zoning resolution to be amended to do this. Believe me, it's a lot more valuable to the city of New York than the city of Yes uh, yesterday. Do I have a second? Second. Yeah. Any discussion? All those in favor? Contrary minded? Abstentions? Done. Unanimous. Uh, Before you adjourn, do we have any update on Manhattan College Parkway? 
Can they go for a hearing? We have to go into executive session to discuss oh, that. For the, uh, oh, yeah, the guy with the... Yeah. The two active approvals. Yep. I saw something. I saw the applications. You, somebody couldn't read the picture. I enlarged it. Mm -hmm. Those permits were for electrical work right. attended to the barbecue. Uh, for, uh, uh, no relevance at all. So that's it. Mm -hmm. uh, Chuck, before you adjourn, uh, there was an item on the agenda about Van Cortland Village, uh, Sedgwick Avenue. That at the last minute, uh, we pushed it out last minute before, oh, okay. before the meeting Wonderful. for October. Okay. The, um, the discussion was to put on the agenda for October because there would be no time to discuss it with our full agenda tonight. So I spoke to Abba Leffler and everyone, and we'll push it out. Fine with me. Thank you. He's on. Uh, I, before. Yes. Sure. Thank you, Farah. So we agreed it would be early on the agenda on October 7th? Yep. Okay. Yep. Proceed. If possible, number one, depending on if we have a crisis. Thank you very much. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, I bid you a fond adieu. We listen and act. Nobody tries to railroad it. We're good, we're good, we're good. Ye of little faith. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. I am leaving tomorrow. I am leaving all of this here. But they're selling. Any of it. Except this. Yeah, I didn't hear public statement. Oh, I don't mean I don't mean that. of all, I think we you know the way. Yes, it's me, I believe to you. Yes. Oh, is that right? Oh, that'd be great. I will put everything tomorrow. No, but the full board. The full board is tomorrow. The following week. Yes, yes, on a Tuesday. Right, right, right. right. Yeah. No, no, I mean all of us, yeah. I mean, this isn't a real thing. We all taking this home and studying it. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to recycle it. All this was the original house.